and welcome to the Circo podcast. I am your guest host for today, Cheryl King, and on today's podcast, we're focusing all on Saudi Arabia, and in particular on data. Now, there's no doubt about it, Saudi Arabia is expanding at scale. So many developments are taking place, including NEOM, the Red Sea development, and Giga projects. And with the use of the latest technology, Saudi Arabia has all the latest tech at its fingertips to utilize data to create better, faster, more informed decision making to not only bring about efficiencies, but also to create world class experiences. Now, this is the part that we'll be focusing on in today's podcast. Data can be used in a variety of ways to bring about value, but how can we use data in ways like never before? And how can it help ensure the customers are treated to world-class experiences? And even when it comes to further enhancing customer experiences, what is it that needs to be done? Well, joining me now to discuss all of this are two experts in their fields with vast amounts of experience when it comes to answering these questions. Joining me, I'd like to welcome Paul Bogan. Uh, he is the Chief Digital Officer for Circo Middle East, uh, and also Christine Pitts, who's the Director of Circo Middle East Experience Lab, which is Circo's Customer Experience and Service Design Agency. Now, let's start with a simple question. First of all, how has the process of collecting data evolved over the past few years, uh, and how has it been aided by technology? It's a really good opening question. Um, you know, the importance of, uh, they say data is a new oil. You know, and the, the importance of both collecting and having a systematic way in how you draw new insights from that data is will be absolutely key to our businesses now, executives and businesses um, in the near future. Some of the positive outcomes we've seen already is that it informs our decision making, you know, providing business uh, quicker agility and, and ways of which optimizing both the staff and the service um, and the overall output, quick identification of operational risk that's on contracts and being able to mitigate those in a more sort of proactive way, which provides a level of transparency between both us and uh, our clients and ultimately our end consumers, which which Chris, you know, talk about um, in a little moment. How has it changed? So the framework itself hasn't changed. I think the big drivers from it really, from my perspective, from an educational perspective, you know, that are, that are um, programming in itself has been taught and now in sort of high school uh, and at a rudimentary level. We have new qualifications on data science and business analytics that are coming through. So we have a new generation of people that are very comfortable on using and managing large data sets to draw these, these new insights. I think combined with that, there's real new policy and guidelines, guidelines uh, from a data management and data governance perspective on actually how we collect, analyze, treat, and then use that to inform um, that decision making. And then from a technology perspective, uh, just to sort of finalize uh, my part, the technology now is so commoditized. There's very little barriers um, um, to entry. There are a lot of new technology startups that are centered around data management, data analysis, uh, real-time information insights that's been used across the entire spectrum of the way businesses deliver their service. So it's vitally important that it is understood. It's vitally important that it's communicated throughout the business and vitally important for everyone that we use as much of it as possible and how we deliver our services in the years to come. So building on what Paul said, I think the one of the big observations is that a lot of government and a lot of businesses are still not very good at making good use of data. And it's very evident as well in my world in terms of looking at customer experience. Mm -hmm. Organizations collect a lot of information about the customer experience, how that works, what, but a lot of it's sort of at the end of the process. You don't really combine all of the types of data that you could in order to actually inform and make informed decisions. And I think um, one, of, one of the biggest takeaways for me around data, not coming from that background, but having all, always been in a world where we spend a lot of time looking at data and evidence for how we improve customer experiences, is that unless the data can be turned into intelligence, something that enables you to act, it doesn't make any difference whether you have it or not. And actually, a lot of, a lot of what we see is how poorly it implemented. The data is. I mean, you yeah. can't compare, for example, the uh, the ability that some of the big technology companies like Google, Facebook, um, 
uh, all of these companies have to be able to use their data and the things they know about you. Like Amazon knows exactly what you want to buy before you even know, know you want to buy it yourself. Right. But most organizations are not set up like that. They're not planning it from the very beginning. And I think the opportunity in Saudi as they're really starting to expand their cities, build things from scratch, is really kind of looking at along the citizen experiences that they're setting up for, what data will actually help you on that journey? So if you think about, mm -hmm. we often talk about customer journeys in my world, and it's a very much around mapping out the journey that a customer goes through when they go through an airport, goes through engaging with moving into a new home in a city, um, the touch points they have along the way, and even just living in a city and using them, the transport system, all of these type of things. What information do you need along each of those touch points that's actually going to tell you something useful that helps you make decisions or change the way that you deliver that service to make it better for that customer? And there's a real over-reliance still on um, using things like customer feedback. In the UAE, for example, there's their customer happiness scores. There's a lot of use of that uh, as well in Saudi in, in a similar way where a lot of the interactions measure your satisfaction with the interaction you just had, but it's at the end. It doesn't tell you anything. And so the new, the new big driver is combining operational data with customer experience data and really trying to match the two. So how long did it take you to get through um, from A to B if you're traveling around the city? Mm -hmm. um, and how much is, how long does an average journey take? Is that a good thing? Is it a good time frame, or did it take longer than you'd expect? Can you combine that operational data with something that the customers are saying? If there was a big delay, can you combine that with people saying, actually, I'm very unhappy today. This didn't live up to my expectations. There's a lot of things there that now that they're building something new, let's, let's do it properly. Let's look at those experiences and let's map out what data is going to help us make good decisions. Um, going forward. And I, yeah. And I, yeah, and I think that's really important, Christine, isn't it? Um, you know, trying to get that customer segmentation model. There's always a risk at the start where you assume that all of your demographics are using the same service or have the same expectancy of that service in the same way. And the reason that our teams work really well together with more on the um, digital and transformational side on my side which is where Christine plays as well, but more from a behavioral science, customer mapping, and I'm looking at more the quantitative, trying to bring those together to get those segmentation models because everyone's needs um, are slightly differently and, and trying to support that is what the KSA and uh, you know, these giga or these cognitive cities have a, an absolutely fantastic opportunity to do if the thinking is put in is put in at the start so, yeah absolutely you know that, that's 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 incredibly interesting points and i think that the customer journey and, and mapping that out is is it, critical and i think even sort of living in the uae and, and looking at saudi as well that the, the reliance on the customer happiness piece before as you say at the end of the experience you know there's there's a lot of things to happen that you can help influence and change that towards the beginning as well and i think it, you always remember your your bad experiences you know that's the one thing that always sticks out so kind of remembering that but also then thinking about your good experiences and how we can leverage that through data is hmm. exceptionally so there's important. also there's also with um relying entirely on customers reporting what they how they feel about a service there is the risk that there's a huge majority of customers who will never respond to those things. They will never give you their opinion. And some of them are having bad experiences. Um, some of them are having great experiences, but unless there's, there's such a so small percentage that will actually take the time to give you that feedback and you're missing out on a lot. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I mean, one of the examples for me in terms of building new cities is I really wish that someone would spend time studying how many times somebody drives uh, takes the wrong turn, takes the, the wrong exit on motorways, for example, or in the spaghetti system of big, um, of big traffic systems and just spends time understanding where, why do people go wrong? Like simple things yeah. like that can make a huge difference to how you experience living in a city as well. And it, that comes from making good use of data and figuring out how can I measure that? How can I actually keep an eye on things like that? And it might not be the easiest one to implement, but it is things like that, that you can do with a lot of transport systems, for example, or a lot of interactions that you have with citizens that if you really think, think it through what's going to be useful, it suddenly then becomes a much more focused approach to making it better.
Thank you very much for that. And now just moving on to some more quite specific examples when it comes to Saudi. I know that Serco uh, has recently partnered with Expro um, to deliver a kingdom-wide asset management and transformation program. Could you first of all tell us a little bit about that, Paul? It's quite a large question. Um, and so I'll, I'll try and draw up on <laughs> uh, uh, my, own, my own experience and relating it to, to other regions of the world as well. We all have the same challenges. We have aging infrastructure, and we have mass urbanization, certainly towards these large cities. And when you look at what the kingdom is embarking to do as part of the 2030 transformation, which is to, I know they haven't opened up in tourism, but having the destinations to really get that pull um, from multiple cultures, demographics, backgrounds coming in into that one place. And one of the real pressing concerns on, on, on governments around the world, but specifically within, within the region, is the exponential operational costs that are having to be incurred as a result of this mass new, uh, both uh, new and old um, aging infrastructure. So having data-driven solutions on the way you deliver anything from facility management, operations and maintenance, using a sort of asset management framework to identify where to spend the money in the most cost-effective way to really drive productivity up and really reduce those, that operational spend. And there are some fantastic frameworks that have been agreed. I mean, there's a, a kingdom-wide framework that's been agreed through Expro to really drive performance management through into both design all the way through to construction and then the overall operations for the life cycle management that's really only uh, and solely aimed at doing just that. Thanks a lot. That's an interesting point there. So when it comes to gigacities, to just move the, the conversation on to this part, uh, they're built, being built very much from scratch in Saudi Arabia. And Saudi really has the opportunity to collect data from the outset. It's creating a, a blueprint, I suppose, for the way forward, because this is a bit of a blank canvas where we can utilize the best of international experience and the best of technology to really bring about some quite tangible change and accelerate uh, the ambition of Vision 2030. So with that in mind, um, Paul and Christine, what are the benefits that you can see in terms of the customer experience in Saudi and also in terms of cost efficiencies and operations? I think start by building it into your process from the beginning. A lot of the time data is the afterthought. It's like, what data do we get from this? It depends on what you're doing. So I'm thinking about customer experience in particular. It's a bit of an afterthought in that space where you're looking at citizen experience and, and shaping new uh, touch points for them to interact with. The last thing you do is figure out how am I going to measure it? Instead, it should come up at the beginning when you're starting to design the process, understand how people go through it, what they value, what they care about, and also what the business needs from the behind the scenes understanding of what um, what do you need to measure? What, what are your KPIs, your success measures of when this service is delivered to its um, peak performance? And, and that's where I see a lot of companies and a lot of organizations go wrong, and, and which is the opportunity when you're start, starting from scratch. You can actually just start by planning that alongside all of the things that you are starting to build. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a very good point in terms of the measurement of. A lot of people think about that at the end, but also I think looking at the, what it is that you're looking, what does success look like? How can you help drive business outcomes? How can measurement act? What is it that you're essentially looking to do where measurement and can actually help inform the whole entire process of what you're looking to get from that? Mm, mm, mm. Would you agree with that, Paul? I do I agree with everything Christine says. We're going through the same experiences with, with, with our, our partners and our clients and, and region. The opportunity, though, is huge. I mean, it's an opportunity that's really exciting. I mentioned cognitive cities before. Uh, there's not many frameworks, not much policy around a cognitive city and the differential between that and a smart city is where a smart city has a very focused position on how you determine what smart is and maybe use 10 to 15% of the data to drive your citizen outcomes uh, going forward. Cognitive is, is really trying to push the bounds where everything is almost interconnected. You're really leveraging the latest of these sensing technologies such as IoT. And you're trying to use around 80 to 85 percent of the data. I don't know of a single city that's done it in the world, so the ambition is huge. But if the planning and preparation can be put in place, which can create a baseline for that continuous improvement that Christine's looking for, you have a real opportunity of getting real 
client and market segmentation models to give you a really deep understanding of what your consumers want and needs and are looking for to move into to these to these areas. Um, the technologies from everything from facial recognition, understanding people movements, which Christine talked about, mobility as a service, where absolutely everything is interconnected, even if we sort of move forward through the sort of electro electric vehicle up into um, semi-autonomous, maybe fully autonomous vehicles, understanding how the entirety of that flow works so you can move someone literally from the point of entry to the point of exit in the most efficient and effective way are some of the outcomes that's going to be incredibly uh, powerful, I think. Um, but everything from improving marketing strategies to understanding uh, um, the, the right focus points from a financial perspective, from banking loans, uh, traffic management, as we just discussed, everything will be delivered in the most um, efficient and effective way if it is done right. There'll be a few bumps in the road, but it's about how you continue to uh, manage and improve that going forward. So a really exciting time yeah. and we're delighted to be involved the, in it. The other thing though about Cognitive Cities that's quite exciting is that it's uh, it's a principle of designing with citizens. And so it's beyond, it goes beyond just smart cities where you're designing new ways of using technology to connect cities it, it, you're now taking the step further and engaging the citizen in the actual design of what that city mm -hmm. should be doing how do you design your mobility system how do you design the the different interactions they have with uh, with parts of the city and that changes the game a little bit and you get you need a lot of data up front to be able to to do that and it's not necessarily mm -hmm. the data that organizations are used to collect because it's not all going to come from quantitative now you have to actually get into that space of, of really talking to people and understanding what they need. Yeah, absolutely. And it seems, I think, with, with Saudi Arabia's position being very much a big blueprint for how things can actually, an example of best practice, right? they almost just have complete sort of clean, clean slate or clean sheet to, to really kind of actually build and bring in all this like international thinking and the latest data sets. And I think I'll probably reference kind of the, the heritage angle or perhaps if you're looking back at, at sort of other cities and smart cities that are looking to move forward at pace. But it really feels, I think, that Saudi's opportunity um, the, the kind of the all the right ingredients are there for them to use uh, data and use it to the best of the ability to, to bring mm -hmm. about a real change. Well, the other thing that Saudi is doing that is actually connect, uh, collecting a lot of data about citizens in one place is the Tawakalna uh, app. I'm not saying that right, but, you know, they, they've basically created a super app for pretty much any service you need as a citizen. And it's collect he must be collecting an immense amount of data about individual citizens about all types of citizens in terms of what they need how they interact what the services they com consume and i don't know yet what they're doing with that data i can only imagine that they are planning what to do with it but they they've started down that journey of trying to connect um, people through technology and that offers a lot of opportunity as well for data and I, I think it would be interesting to see as well how the individual giga projects take on something like that. They'll probably be building on what's already existing within this app, but they will also need to create something that's specific um, for, say, Neom or, or where, uh, whichever mm -hmm. of the projects mm -hmm. we're talking about. Yeah, because an interesting one, isn't it? That's the, that is a saying, isn't it? It's a, it's a journey, not a destination. Everyone at this current moment in time just has too much data. They don't know how to segregate it. They don't know what's good. They don't know what's bad. They don't know what new additional data sets they need to collect. But those drivers that we spoke about at the start, almost everything is coming at the right time for, for, for the kingdom and the, and the giga project to try and maximize and materialize what people have been thinking about for the last five years and to the reality of of, of, of a real cognitive um, customer, consumer-led um, city-wide solution. It's, um, so the biggest really problem true. with data is often that it's not accessible. You have no way of actually making use of it or processing it. Mm. Big data is a great concept in itself, but you need to be able to process it. It's impossible for a human being to get through the types of data sets that we're now talking about. So you need to invest in the technology that goes behind it. You really need to think about how, that what is that purpose and how do we access it and who needs to access it. Right information, right time, right people.
And is that, is that Christine, um, to, to the point, I'm just thinking about any challenges that are posed for, for Saudi in terms of kind of realising this very kind of data orientated, future focused um, sort of kingdom. Do, do you think it is around, it's kind of just really, I guess, understanding data, um, harnessing big data and what the potential is and perhaps um, in terms of the challenges, um, do you think that perhaps the, there is a bit of, um, I guess, education, understanding that needs to come with that about really how to ex extract the real value out of all these streams of data that can really drive customer experiences? Well, I, don't, I don't think any city has got it quite right or any government has quite figured out how to make use of the immense amount of data that they process um, on behalf of citizens. If they were, all of our services across every service that we interact with, uh, interact with would be completely seamless. And it would be that experience where you move from one mm -hmm. thing to another and they know everything about you and it's easy. And they, you know, they, they know, they, they know exactly what you need before you even decide that you need to contact them about it. Now that's, that's a, future where you kind of have the conversation about what, at what point is is that useful versus at what point does that become a little bit sort of big brothery and, and creepy but there's also I, I think there there is a lot of almost new ways of working that has to be defined for this there isn't really a model they can go and look at there's there's great examples of best practice around the world but I don't think anyone's quite nailed it in terms of delivering seamless citizen experiences that are actually delivered because they understand the experience and they understand the data behind it and they're able to make use of that data. Mm. No, you're right. You're, you're right. You're right. All the existing data, data resides in multiple platforms. That's, that's, that's the real challenge of it and trying, but there are no integration layers. There are no platforms, whether anyone has done it with the right sort of proficiency that, that delivers the outcomes. You're right, Christine, but you touched on one really important point. The biggest challenge the kingdom's going to have as it opens up for the 2030 transformation, as it opens up to citizens of the world that are going to come, hopefully live, certainly um, um, from a tourism perspective, but, but they want them to live um, and help developing that. Is the privacy concerns that's going to come across with having this volume of mass data on, on, on individual uh, groups of individuals, uh, movements across across the city, and at some point, um, that will come to a conflict. And, and the governance around that is what I'm sure that they are they are they are thinking about at this moment in time, as is every other government in in the world. We know the kingdom yeah. um, has done a number of um, agreements uh, with. With, with the UK being one of them, was one of the most um, certainly forward thinking within this space, obviously very close ties to the UAE in the 2070, the AI transformation programs we have here. So, but it's definitely the, probably the largest challenge that will present itself for everyone and not just the kingdom for the, in, in the years to come. Yeah. And when, when you, as a consumer or as a customer, or as a citizen, give someone your data, it's your, it's personal information about me as a citizen. If I give you my data, there's a contract there that I expect that my data will be respected, that you will treat it with care and that you won't use it against me. And, and I, I think that's a challenge for all governments. And we've seen lots of different implementations of that across the world with some um, like the UK and the Europe in, in general to so the EU implementing very, very strict rules that almost hinder all of the ability that uh, data could actually have for companies and for governments because you have very limited um, scope of where you can use it without getting explicit permission whereas there's a balance somewhere in there you need to you need to respect people's data but you also then need to give them something in return if i give you my data so if i give a big technology company my data i expect them to give me something in return you know this make it bespoke for me make it something that yeah. makes the experience better for me there are more more benefits to massive data aggregation than there'll ever be to the to the negative consequences it's just something that has to be considered uh, going forward that trust people, yeah, if people absolutely. trust you to deal with it they will and they can see mm -hmm. the benefits they will okay. contribute and can you also tell us how data facilities management transformation programs will really kind of benefit the kingdom? The original framework was, was called Mashwa. It's now called um, Expro. Uh, we've been working for the last two years. And earlier this year, we delivered what was known as and is known as the Blue Book, which is the nationwide um, manual uh, to create standardization across all ministries um, in the kingdom 
And it's got twofold, really. One is to bring uh, each ministry up to a level of maturity and their understanding and the application of asset management and operational and maintenance excellence and to raise the bar on uh, asset management competency within each of the ministries. The outcome, uh, the, the driver has always been the same. Standardization is absolutely fantastic. We've touched a lot on, on data management, governance and control, which is actually within um, uh, the blue book, within the manual itself. But really it's about trying to reduce and mitigate that operational spend that I mentioned uh, at the start of this discussion so that we can reallocate, or sorry, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia can reallocate uh, funds in towards these sort of giga projects and other, other government-wide um, initiatives. Um, data management, asset management is actually key in the enablement for that. So understanding what you have, where it's located, what condition it's in, what is obsolete, what intervention with respect to capital and or operational costs that you would need to assume to extend that economic life and make sure that the infrastructure and government services provided to its, both its, its citizens and its workers is there for the years to come. And thank you so much for that. And now just tell us a little bit more about the future of data collection. Perhaps this is a big question to end the podcast on. Um, what do you see is happening next in Saudi? We've spoken a lot about the value of data. We, we've spoken a lot about behavioral science. We've spoken about big data. We, we spoke about cognitive data as well. When it comes to the future of, of Saudi and in terms of how it really crafts a path for the way forward, um, what would you think the future is uh, when it comes to data collection? One of the things that is already in place in Saudi is that acceptance of digital uh, government services. And our survey earlier this year really showed that people are quite happy with it and they're quite happy to engage with government in that way. And it also has one of the highest percentages in the region of, of um, the amount of people who have access to a smartphone device, who are using things like social media on a regular basis. And so that acceptance and that um, pervasiveness of technology is already there. So they're building on, they're basically pushing on an open door to start doing some of this. And that, that's, I think, pretty exciting. And they've also got some really big ambitions, which are going to have to come with some pretty targeted strategies of how to actually make it happen. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And yes, and as I say, pushing on an open door, that's a, a nice way to, to, put, to put it. Uh, Paul, would you have anything to add all around uh, data and the future in Saudi? No, the, just sort of trying to think more about the future of data really for the kingdom in 2030. What does, what, you know, what does that mean? What does it entail? What does that look like? The volume of which we consume data at this moment in time is, is an incredible, and that's only going to be exacerbated even more with the likes of real IoT strategies, sensors, almost everything being completely interconnected into one, um, certainly one social fabric. How they interconnect that is going to be the challenge. So that's going to be really interesting in how we uh, manage and actually use that uh, in, in light of some of the um, concerns and, and constraints that, that Christine has mentioned before. I think a fundamental understanding of the application of artificial intelligence, you know, the practical applications of that, both from um, a computer and vision perspective on how we use our CCTVs or manage and operate, how people interact now that everything, pretty much everything is moved online from a consumer perspective through to data science and the real understanding of how to apply that in a way which you can look at big data sets, you can do big data analytics, which gives you high levels of probability of making an improvement that drives forward that, that customer uh, and, and overall customer experience is going to be really interesting. I think we're going to see more and more uh, educational uh, positions within this space. You're going to have you know, data scientists, behavioral analytics, uh, cyber, um, you know, cyber specialists are going to be some of the three most in-demand uh, types of skill sets I would think that the kingdom is going to need certainly over, over the next 10 years. Um, and what was quite interesting was, you know, if we start to then sort of branch out just a little bit more, some of the ambassadors that we have been speaking to, some of the clients are really interesting. And in, so what comes next? 
after that artificial intelligence. Well, it's just really high computational mathematics, isn't it? it enabled through a computer, but they are starting to look at sort of um, uh, 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 quantum computing, which should be really interesting with respect to cryptography. And maybe that's one of the ways in which we mitigate and manage and control some of the data privacy and governance concerns that we, we mentioned before. So the future is incredibly bright. I still think we're at the infancy of really understanding and using data in a, in a practical sense. I think there's lots of use cases within HR, within finance, but in a way which you use it across the entirety of your city. But the opportunity uh, to, to leverage that for what they're trying to achieve is, is I think we're in a, a great time uh, and a great time for me and Christine and yourselves to be here to watch and help them support that and their their ambition to 2030. And that seems like a really good point to end on. Thank you so much for, for that, actually, and also for joining us. You know, thank you, uh, Paul, and thank you, Christine. It's been really interesting to get your different insights and expertise on the, the future of data and the role it plays in Saudi Arabia. And thank you also very much uh, to our listeners for joining on the Circo podcast. Uh, that's been an informative discussion today, and we look forward to seeing you next time. And also give us a follow on our social media channels. Thanks again, and see you soon.